My name is uh, Todd uh, Massey. I am the uh, Director of uh, Mechanical Circulatory Support and Heart Transplantation at Thomas Jefferson uh, University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It is my pleasure uh, to be able to speak to you today about temporary uh, support strategies uh, for cardiogenic shock. Uh, this is an area that has been uh, an interest of mine for pretty much my uh, entire uh, career. The majority of clinical trials uh, and algorithms that have been developed uh, concerning uh, cardiogenic shock for uh, temporary support have been uh, predominantly uh, developed around acute myocardial infarction, uh, cardiogenic uh, shock. In uh, the discussions today, I think we will predominantly be focusing on acute myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, but nonetheless, the uh, lessons that are learned here, I do believe are applicable uh, to other forms of cardiogenic shock as long as you take in uh, certain uh, considerations, especially being the uh, likelihood uh, for early uh, recovery uh, that is typically uh, seen more with the acute myocarditis uh, cases and postpartum cardiomyopathy cases, as well as taking into consideration uh, the more commonly uh, need for biventricular support in uh, giant cell myocarditis. In the United States, uh, cardiovascular uh, disease uh, still accounts for the majority of uh, deaths. When especially uh, looking at acute myocardial infarction uh, with ST elevated myocardial infarctions, roughly about uh, 10 to 15 percent of these individuals will develop cardiogenic shock. This equates to roughly about 60,000 cases uh, per year. And the cardiogenic shock is predominantly due to left ventricular dysfunction. Other uh, potential uh, contributors can be obviously uh, structural uh, problems with the heart, uh, being the development of uh, severe mitral regurgitation or ventricular uh, septal uh, rupture. One of the original uh, definitions of uh, cardiogenic shock was developed by uh, Dr. Killip, who was the uh, chief of cardiology at New York uh, Hospital. He did this in the time period where they were developing uh, cardiac critical care units, uh, which were uh, specifically designed uh, units to care for this uh, population of uh, patients. Uh, this past year, we did uh, celebrate the 50th anniversary of cardiac critical care units, and uh, certainly this was an advancement uh, within the field and has uh, substantially contributed to the improved care of these uh, individuals. Dr. Killip gave a uh, definition of cardiogenic shock uh, that was based on uh, clinical uh, parameters. In the uh, shock trial, uh, they did uh, utilize the uh, clinical uh, definition of cardiogenic shock as originally defined uh, by Dr. Killip, as well as they uh, introduced uh, hemodynamic criteria for defining uh, shock in addition. The shock trial was a revolutionary uh, trial in the field of cardiogenic uh, shock. It randomized patients with acute MI cardiogenic shock to either receive medical therapy, uh, that being uh, lytic agents, or patients were to receive uh, PCI of the infarct-related artery. The uh, shock trial was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 1999. The study revealed a significant survival benefit at six months and at 12 months in those individuals that had received uh, PCI of the infarct-related artery. Of note, during the index hospitalization, uh, there was no significant uh, survival benefit with uh, either uh, therapy. Uh, subsequent uh, to this trial, there has been uh, a uh, emphasis in the United States 
on improving door uh, to balloon times based on the outcomes of this study. Uh, this has become a nationally tracked uh, quality uh, metric, and it is uh, directly uh, tied to CMS uh, reimbursement. Revascularization of the infarct-related artery has improved outcomes uh, substantially, with mortalities in the 70s being roughly 70 uh, percent to those in the current era, and uh, including the shock trial being approximately uh, 50 percent. The time is muscle has become a familiar slogan across all emergency departments and cardiac cath labs. Uh, approximately uh, two decades uh, since the shock trial, the vast majority of uh, randomized controlled trials or large uh, meta-analysis of trials have really uh, focused on this concept of uh, primary revascularization and also on the medical management of patients in cardiogenic shock that have received uh, PCI of the infarct-related artery. Uh, some contemporary uh, studies uh, include the uh, culprit uh, shock trial. Uh, this looked at uh, multi-vessel uh, PCI, including the culprit artery plus any other disease versus uh, culprit artery-only PCI. Uh, the trial did not reveal any uh, added uh, benefit. Uh, the SHOCK-2 trial looked at a post-PCI of the infarct-related artery uh, population that was randomized to either uh, receive an intraortic balloon pump or not receive an intraortic uh, balloon pump and did not reveal any uh, significant uh, survival benefit. A large uh, Cochrane uh, database system review looked at the ionotropic agents and vasodilatory agents that are used in the treatment of cardiogenic shock in an MI population to see if there were any benefits to certain ionotropes or uh, vasodilator uh, therapy. There really was no uh, difference in uh, which agents were utilized. Of note, in this trial, they did uh, focus on a uh, novel uh, calcium sensitizer, which was hoped to uh, potentially improve the outcomes in individuals, and uh, it really did not reveal any significant difference uh, in any of the agents uh, utilized. Uh, there was also a, uh, the TRIUMPH study, which looked at a nonspecific inhibitor of uh, nitric oxide synthesis to see if this could potentially uh, improve the outcomes. And unfortunately, uh, it did not reveal any significant difference either. I think it's of particular note that, you know, even in the age of uh, PCI of the infarct-related artery. In these uh, contemporary uh, studies, the vast majority of them continue uh, to show roughly about a 50% uh, survival uh, in this population. And there have not really been uh, substantial uh, gains in this population uh, since the uh, shock trial. And, you know, uh, potentially uh, with our focus on revascularization and then the subsequent management of these individuals in the current models, uh, perhaps we are kind of uh, hitting the uh, glass ceiling. And, you know, maybe it is the time that we uh, get out of our comfort zone and continue to uh, move into other areas of novel uh, therapy. When you look at the trials in cardiogenic shock utilizing uh, mechanical circulatory support, uh, these trials are very uh, few in number and include very few uh, patients. Uh, there, to my knowledge, are only uh, four randomized controlled trials looking at mechanical circulatory support in cardiogenic shock. Uh, none of these trials have revealed a survival benefit some of the trials uh, did reveal some hemodynamic gain, uh, but this was not necessarily uh, translated to survival uh, benefit. And if you were to parse down, uh, you know, roughly how many patients have been looked at, it, it really only comes out to uh, right around 200 patients uh, in total that uh, have been involved in randomized trials utilizing mechanical circulatory support. Nonetheless, if you were to look over uh, the past few uh, decades, uh, there's certainly uh, been a vibrant increase in the utilization of mechanical circulatory support devices in this population. There has been uh, a very substantial growth in the utilization of ECMO in these populations, 
and not necessarily uh, with any significant gain in mortality in this ECMO population over these uh, time periods. So really uh, today, taking all this into consideration, uh, you know, what I'm going to speak on today is really based on uh, anecdotal evidence. And I think what we know here is very little, but what we are ignorant of is immense. And certainly there presents opportunity going forward. The majority of the clinical pathways and paradigms that we utilize in cardiogenic shock have really been uh, based on uh, individual physician and individual institutions and was derived predominantly from uh, intuition and ad hoc uh, problem uh, solving on the fly. Uh, and it is not uncommon for, you know, the treatment of cardiogenic shock to be somewhat kind of a, a goat rodeo where it's kind of a very chaotic event on the spur of the moment and uh, not necessarily uh, based on uh, evidence. And I think, you know, going forward, what we really need to focus on is uh, systematic problem solving and utilizing uh, mechanical support strategies in uh, cardiogenic uh, shock, and we certainly need to develop a systematic approach to this, uh, potentially even uh, pulling uh, resources nationally and uh, internationally. Uh, I understand that performing randomized controlled trials in uh, these type situations is not necessarily without uh, difficulty, as uh, you clearly have some ethical uh, issues that come up uh, about uh, applying therapy to a certain population and not to another population in acute moments where it could potentially uh, be life-saving. Uh, there are also issues with uh, consenting patients in these type of uh, situations. But nonetheless, I, I don't think you can jeopardize good science for this uh, going forward. And we need to certainly be able to derive methodologies to where we can uh, base our decisions solidly on uh, good evidence. We uh, had previously uh, called for a national initiative uh, many years ago uh, to develop a cardiogenic uh, shock uh, system. Uh, a lot of the lessons that we had learned uh, had come from uh, looking at the uh, trauma system, uh, which has been applied in the United States uh, to great improvement uh, in outcomes. And we did felt there were a lot of similarities uh, between uh, trauma care and acute cardiogenic uh, shock care. Uh, we had originally uh, proposed a, a three-tier uh, system uh, that would be uh, developed in a regional manner through statewide initiatives uh, that was based on the different resources that were available at the uh, participating uh, institutions. It really hinged on uh, collaboration amongst the different uh, institutions and the development of uh, protocols and uh, clinical care uh, pathways. Quality uh, reporting uh, initiatives uh, can have uh, consequences uh, that are not necessarily uh, readily apparent, especially when the risk adjustment is not felt to uh, adequately assign the appropriate risks uh, to the uh, population being studied. I do think uh, this has been evident in states uh, with uh, quality reporting in relation to uh, cardiogenic shock patients, as illustrated here, uh, where in New York State and in uh, Massachusetts, you noted a decrease in the incidence uh, and utilization of uh, PCI in cabbage in populations with acute MI cardiogenic uh, shock. And quite frankly, uh, the access to care uh, changes, and ultimately you're kind of comparing uh, apples uh, to oranges. And we certainly uh, saw this in the development of our program. And quite frankly, uh, individual practitioners were reluctant to uh, treat this uh, population. And it did offer us opportunity uh, to develop a regionalized uh, network of uh, care uh, to help uh, care for this uh, population. Uh, and we, we did notice the significance of this. And in uh, roughly uh, 2000, uh, we developed a cardiogenic shock 
uh, critical care uh, transport team. And not only did we uh, agree to take these patients uh, in transport, but we actually uh, sought these patients out and actually uh, went and got them uh, with a, a specialized team. I think this uh, was important on uh, a couple of different fronts. Uh, number one, it certainly improved the care of these individuals uh, in transport, and it did decrease their uh, mortality when you're taking a, a very sick patient and transporting them uh, hospital to hospital. Probably one of the more important areas was the fact that you made uh, odd bedfellows out of uh, some individuals that maybe normally uh, would not have ended up in bed together. Through this, uh, we were able to uh, develop uh, interinstitutional uh, care delivery models for this population of patients, and you were able to actually uh, break down these institutional uh, barriers. Uh, not only did we uh, share and instruct uh, our uh, partners in this in our uh, institutional protocols and care pathways, we actually uh, actively uh, trained uh, these individuals within uh, our system in the uh, application of uh, mechanical circulatory support in this population and we were able to become highly uh, clinically uh, integrated with them. And I think this had uh, substantial uh, benefits to this population. If, if you go back in time and look at the systems uh, that were originally uh, deployed in uh, cardiogenic shock uh, in relation to uh, mechanical support, the majority of the systems initially were uh, pulsatile uh, systems. Uh, the Abiumed uh, BVS 5000 was the first uh, FDA-approved device uh, for this in uh, 1992. Uh, this device uh, was uh, a very uh, cumbersome device. Uh, it was uh, difficult to implant, uh, required a full cardiopulmonary bypass with uh, sternotomy. Uh, it also required, uh, in most instances, uh, bypass to uh, full cardiopulmonary bypass to explant the system and you did have to uh, either leave open the sternum or reopen the sternum uh, to explant it. It had a uh, fairly uh, high uh, incidence of uh, adverse complications, and especially uh, in relation to thromboembolic uh, complications and uh, uh, bleeding. Due to the uh, technology uh, that was available uh, at that time, uh, the bar was quite high, and the majority of the patients that um, received these systems uh, for uh, support in cardiogenic shock normally either had ongoing CPR or had recently had CPR, and the majority had uh, well-established uh, multi-system uh, organ failure. Uh, nonetheless, you know, despite the uh, clear uh, obstacles uh, to this, uh, we actually had uh, reported survival rates uh, anywhere from uh, 29 uh, to 60 percent. And some of these individuals, uh, you know, made it uh, through and were able to go on and live uh, full lives. It was not uncommon at that time for me, you know, if I put a device in one of these individuals uh, and he subsequently, uh, you know, died, the uh, usual comment was that uh, the device killed him. Uh, if they actually uh, survived, uh, it was, uh, well, they didn't need it. Over the uh, nearly uh, two uh, decades since the uh, FDA approval of the uh, Abiumed uh, BVS 5000, uh, there has been a transition away from uh, surgically placed central uh, pumps to more peripherally uh, placed continuous uh, flow uh, devices. Uh, these devices uh, can be broken down really uh, broadly into two groups, uh, one uh, being the microaxial flow pumps, uh, which is uh, represented uh, by the uh, impella, and the other being the centrifugal pericorporeal uh, temporary pumps. Uh, the centrifugal pumps are typically uh, deployed as either uh, in conjunction with uh, 
an ECMO uh, type system with an oxygenator or they can uh, all be used independently as just uh, VAD uh, systems other than the uh, CardioHelp system uh, which uh, has a integral uh, oxygenator uh, with it. The thing about the uh, peripherally uh, placed uh, pumps is that uh, you have uh, certain degrees of support available uh, with the different uh, pumps, which is uh, dependent on really their cannula size. Uh, the larger the cannulas, uh, typically uh, the greater the flow that you get. As far as you know, which pump to uh, employ in which uh, circumstance, that typically is based on uh, the degree of uh, flow that you need, uh, the rapidity of actually being able uh, to get someone on support uh, surrounding uh, the certain clinical uh, circumstances, uh, as well as probably uh, each individual's uh, familiarity with the different systems. Uh, typically, if you have uh, a more seriously ill patient that requires uh, significant uh, flow and uh, that has uh, pulmonary involvement, you're typically going to be going uh, with a veno-arterial uh, system. With these systems, there are certain circumstances where it may be uh, contraindicated to place a certain device. Uh, if you were to have a thrombus involving uh, the left ventricle or the uh, left atrium, you're definitely going to wa want to stay away from devices that are, that are deployed uh, within these uh, cavities. If uh, you were to have a clinical situation where you had a ventricular septal defect, uh, you're going to want to avoid uh, devices that would directly unload the left ventricle uh, and the fact that they could increase uh, right-to-left shunting and uh, certainly uh, worsen uh, hypoxemia. One uh, area that comes up is uh, aortic insufficiency. If you have moderate, severe uh, aortic insufficiency, uh, Typically, none of the devices will be able to adequately address this uh, independently uh, because you typically end up with a uh, reflow uh, phenomena. With that, you're going to have to address the aortic valve uh, surgically or uh, percutaneously uh, prior to placing a uh, person uh, on support to give adequate uh, perfusion. Typically, the temporary devices are mainly deployed for uh, rapid support in someone uh, to help reverse or uh, prevent uh, end organ dysfunction. And uh, in a lot of instances, they are utilized as a bridge to uh, more durable uh, systems or to uh, cardiac uh, transplantation. One of the uh, areas, other areas to keep in mind uh, with these systems, especially in relation to uh, bridging uh, to recovery, is the short uh, durations of uh, FDA approval for these devices. The uh, Impella systems are uh, approved for up to uh, six days of use. The, the pericorporeal pumps are only approved for six hours of use. Uh, and this certainly should be uh, taken into consideration uh, when you're looking at uh, recovering someone. If you have the high likelihood that you think someone will recover, you can certainly utilize these devices for uh, longer uh, periods of time. Uh, otherwise, if you think the duration uh, for recovery is going to be uh, much longer than a, uh, a week uh, to 10 days, you should be probably looking at transitioning over to a more durable uh, system. Now I would like uh, to uh, address some uh, of the specifics with uh, each of the uh, systems that are uh, currently uh, utilized today. I will start first with uh, veno arterial ECMO. One of the things with veno arterial ECMO is that it is uh, you know, fairly uh, easy to insert. Uh, it doesn't require any major uh, surgical skills uh, to be able to uh, do this. And many uh, different disciplines have been able to be trained uh, to uh, place someone on veno-arterial uh, ECMO support. 
I mean, pretty much if you can place uh, central lines, uh, you can get someone on venoarterial ECMO with the right uh, instruction. Uh, and certainly we've seen uh, intensivists being trained and interventional cardiologists being trained uh, to do this. Uh, putting someone on VA ECMO does not require necessarily any uh, echo guidance or fluoroscopic guidance. And for that reason, it essentially could be deployed in any location uh, within the hospital. And patients have uh, gone on uh, support uh, in remote locations uh, through the military use and uh, even through uh, first responder uh, type of uh, situations. One thing to uh, point out about VA ECMO is it is not necessarily uh, the most favorable system uh, to help with uh, myocardial uh, recovery. If you uh, notice in the uh, cardiophysiology uh, slides, I mean, it's, it's very effective at restoring uh, tissue perfusion and gives you probably the best flow. Uh, but unfortunately, it does significantly increase uh, afterload and myocardial oxygen demand. Perhaps this is what is uh, contributing to this uh, lack of improved outcomes uh, with ECMO uh, over time that we have seen. I think one of the uh, major uh, areas of uh, technological development and improvement has been uh, in the oxygenators. The uh, Quadrox DE polymethylpentene uh, oxygenator was certainly uh, a leap forward uh, as far as biocompatibility and uh, decreased uh, resistance to flow and uh, diffusion parameters in a fairly uh, small area-sized uh, membrane. And it essentially uh, eliminated any uh, plasma leakage uh, from these uh, circuits. Uh, historically, uh, we had uh, major uh, issues with this with the microporous hollow fiber uh, polypropylene oxygenators. And certainly, uh, once you got beyond six hours or attempted to come off any anticoagulation uh, with these uh, oxygenators, uh, you would get uh, torrential uh, plasma leakage and really uh, a lot of damage uh, to the blood elements. And, you know, initially your patient may uh, have gotten better uh, for a few hours or so, but then subsequently uh, really would take a turn for the worse due to the uh, cascade of the inflammatory mediators that were being uh, activated. Uh, typically, uh, venoarterial ECMO is uh, most commonly deployed uh, percutaneously uh, in the femoral artery and vein. Uh, we are uh, advocates for uh, prophylactically placing a, a distal uh, perfusion uh, cannula being either a 6 French to 8 French. Uh, the wires for this should be placed prior to placing uh, the wires for the arterial cannula. Uh, this will markedly decrease your uh, incidence of uh, distal limb uh, ischemia. Uh, one of the uh, other areas that we have uh, utilized quite frequently is uh, subclavian artery uh, cannulation through an 8 millimeter hemoshield graft. Uh, unique to this is the uh, possibility for uh, hyperperfusion up of the upper extremity, but this can be uh, fairly easily controlled by uh, utilizing a vessel loop uh, distal to your arterial cannulation site, for which you can adjust at the bedside uh, utilizing a right radial uh, A-line. By utilizing the synclavian artery uh, as an outflow and the right internal jugular uh, vein as an inflow, uh, you're able to uh, mobilize these patients uh, fairly uh, readily. Overall, given the improved performance of the uh, oxygenators as well as the, the pumps, uh, we typically will anticoagulate uh, with initial uh, placement. We usually uh, try to obtain an ACT of about 250 uh, seconds. Uh, we then allow uh, at least uh, 12 to 24 hours of a time period for stabilization without anticoagulation. And then we will typically uh, resume anticoagulation with ACT goals of about 150 to 180. We do not ever uh, give uh, heparin boluses uh, after the uh, initial uh, placement. If you are in a circumstance where you absolutely cannot utilize anticoagulation, these systems have become uh, safe enough and biocompatible enough that you can come off uh, heparinization, and you should not... Uh, 
feel that you are uh, absolutely wedded uh, to remaining on anticoagulation. Certainly, if you can utilize it, great. If you can't, then uh, you need to just stop it. And we, we've been fairly successful uh, at doing this. One area that comes up not infrequently uh, with VA ECMO is the question of unloading. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, techniques that can be utilized uh, to address this. Our primary technique that we have gone to is uh, atrial septostomy with a transatrial uh, cannula placement of an uh, additional inflow cannula. Uh, we feel that this is probably the safest method of being able to uh, sort of uh, directly uh, vent the uh, LV and the fact that you're able to gain uh, access through the uh, venous system to the uh, arterial system. It is probably uh, also the most effective at uh, protecting uh, your lungs. Occasionally, you can uh, even place a cannula across the uh, mitral valve if you feel you need to do this. We usually consider uh, doing this in patients that have uh, severe LV dysfunction, and typically on echo, uh, you will see that uh, the aortic valve is not opening and that they have uh, echo uh, smoke within the uh, left ventricle, which is signifying uh, stasis. We always, in our uh, venoarterial ECMO placements, patients have a, a Swan-Gantz catheter that is placed so that we can monitor the pulmonary artery diastolic uh, pressure. And when we've seen the uh, pulmonary artery diastolic pressure getting above 20, uh, this is typically a trigger for us uh, to decompress the left side of the heart. It is certain that not all people uh, will need uh, LV uh, unloading. Uh, if you have a heart that is ejecting and uh, does not have any uh, stasis uh, within it, and you see pulsatility on your A-line, you're probably safe in not doing this. In those individuals where you're not seeing pulsatility and you do have uh, smoke within your left ventricle with an elevated PAD, uh, the first maneuver would be uh, to come down on your uh, VA ECMO flows to decrease uh, afterload, as well as potentially adding uh, low doses of dibutamine. If it fails to respond to this, we think you should probably uh, proceed with this, and we're, we're quite liberal in doing this. We think that the uh, uh, reasons for doing this uh, outweigh the reasons uh, for not doing it, and we're very much believers in uh, unloading the left ventricle to help uh, promote recovery, as well as preventing uh, stasis and thrombosis formation, which seems to be a uh, particular concern in those patients that have newly infarcted uh, muscle. And certainly, it is the best way to optimize pulmonary function for uh, potential subsequent weaning uh, from VA ECMO and potentially for subsequent uh, bridging uh, to more durable uh, systems. One of the other uh, Areas uh, unique to uh, venoarterial ECMO is the so-called uh, Harlequin syndrome. This is where you have uh, essentially a blue upper body and a red uh, lower body, and this is seen with uh, femoral arterial cannulation for VA ECMO. Uh, this is the reason uh, that you should have a, a right radial A-line uh, placed to monitor uh, saturations within the right upper extremity. You should probably also have uh, cerebral oximetry uh, probes on. The transition zone is basically uh, determined by the uh, competition uh, between the native LV and the uh, ECMO uh, circuit uh, within the uh, aortic column. And in the presence of poorly uh, functioning uh, lungs, you can end up uh, with an area of uh, hypoxemia. If you were to uh, encounter this, uh, and especially involving the uh, head vessels, uh, this is a, an emergency because you could end up with a degree of epoxia to the point to where you could suffer uh, irreversible uh, neurologic uh, damage. There are a number of uh, means of being able to uh, address this. One area I'd like to uh, also briefly touch on is... Uh, ambulatory uh, VA uh, ECMO, uh, we had originally become uh, fairly uh, interested in this uh, through our experience with our uh, hybrid uh, VAD population, a hybrid VAD being an implantable continuous flow LVAD with a pericopoil RVAD. Uh, 
Uh, we had uh, developed a, a method to be able to uh, close the sternum with these individuals and subsequently to remotely uh, decannulate them. And uh, we were able to get the patients up and ambulate them within the intensive care unit and get them off positive pressure ventilation. And we found this to be of great benefit in uh, rehabbing these patients and uh, preventing uh, some of the complications associated with uh, sedation and uh, recumbency and positive pressure ventilation. Uh, and it certainly improved our results. And I think you know, simultaneously uh, with this, we had noted uh, increased uh, utilization of uh, ambulation and uh, extubation in the uh, Vino Vino uh, ECMO group. Uh, we have had uh, some experience with this in Vino Arterial ECMO, and I think uh, going forward in the future uh, that you will probably see uh, more of this due to the positive uh, outcomes. Obviously, uh, the biggest uh, obstacle to this right now is the fear for uh, inadvertent uh, decannulation and the fact that the majority of systems are not really uh, designed for this. Uh, we think this is probably uh, technical and can, uh, is fairly uh, easily solvable. I want to speak a little bit about the CardioHelp system. The CardioHelp system was really uh, designed for transportability. Uh, none of the other systems are really uh, designed for this, and you know, usually it's kind of an acrobatic uh, feat to actually be able to uh, move these patients uh, within hospitals and uh, between hospitals. Uh, the CardioHelp uh, system uh, is really ergonomically designed and has an integrated uh, pump and uh, oxygenator that is uh, specifically designed uh, for uh, you know, being able to move uh, patients within hospitals and uh, between hospitals. Uh, it also, uh, within the circuit, has uh, some uh, sensors that are uh, embedded and can give uh, useful information, uh, being uh, the, the capability to monitor the system pressures, uh, SVO2, and uh, hematocrit. It is a, a small area uh, system that can be uh, fully primed in less than 15 minutes. The tandem uh, system is a uh, pericorporeal uh, LVAD uh, that is uh, the inflow is typically placed uh, transeptally through the femoral vein uh, and is typically a 21 uh, French inflow that is coupled with either a 17 uh, to 19 French arterial outflow within the uh, femoral artery. The uh, Tandem system also has the capabilities for uh, RVAD uh, support, uh, utilizing a uh, fairly unique uh, dual lumen cannula called the Protec Duo cannula that can be placed within the right internal jugular uh, vein and uh, subsequently uh, through the uh, pulmonary uh, valve. It also has uh, capabilities uh, to add an oxygenator with the tandem uh, lung. Uh, the system itself, uh, the pump gets up on a uh, hydrodynamic uh, bearing. It does require uh, full anticoagulation at implant as well as uh, subsequent uh, to that. It is uh, flushed uh, continuously uh, through the motor housing with a heparin uh, solution uh, to uh, cool the uh, uh, bearings as well as to prevent uh, deposition of fibrin uh, within the lower uh, pump uh, chamber. It can give you uh, up to four liters uh, per minute uh, flow. It is typically placed in the cardiac cath labs uh, utilizing uh, fluoroscopic and echo uh, guidance. It does take a uh, special uh, skill set to be able to uh, traverse the uh, septum with the uh, inflow uh, cannula. Uh, the Abiumed, uh system, uh, the impellas, are a uh, unique uh, microaxial flow uh, class that uh, has a, an integrated uh, motor uh, within the cannula and uh, impeller. Uh, they are placed across the uh, aortic uh, valve and draw blood almost in a venturi-type manner from the left ventricle uh, into the uh, ascending aorta. The actual uh, system itself comes in uh, multiple uh, different sizes, uh, one being a uh, 2.5 liter per minute flow pump that is 13 French uh, to a 5 liter per minute uh, pump that is uh, 22 uh, French. If you were to look at the uh, hemodynamic uh, parameters as far as the potential for myocardial recovery, 
Uh, the Abiumed system is probably the most favorable uh, in the fact that it is uh, an LVAD that is placed uh, directly within the left ventricle. Uh, nonetheless, at the uh, lower uh, and smaller size uh, cannulas, you really don't get that much uh, flow, and it usually requires uh, the larger size uh, cannula, which obviously carries the uh, other risk uh, associated with that, and they typically have to be uh, surgically uh, placed either within the uh, femoral artery or within the uh, subclavian uh, artery. You do uh, heparinize for initial uh, placement of the pump, but subsequently you do not need any uh, systemic heparinization uh, from then on as the system is uh, flushed with a heparinized uh, solution through its uh, purge uh, system. I think one of the biggest advantages of the Impella system is this was uh, one of the first uh, devices that really uh, targeted uh, interventional cardiology. And with that, uh, it was, it's almost been like a renaissance within interventional uh, cardiology that ultimately they uh, have gained great interest in uh, addressing this other 50% of the patients uh, that undergo a PCI, the infarct-related artery, in uh, acute myocardiogenic shock. At this juncture, I'd like to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about the uh, theoretical underpinnings of our program, as well as some of the operational designs that we uh, undertook. Mechanical uh, circuitry support was really uh, developed on the uh, backbone of uh, acute cardiogenic shock. And as you can see here in this paper in 1971, uh, Dr. DeBakey uh, describes some of the uh, first LVADs uh, placed, and they were placed in post-cardiotomy cardiogenic shock. And Dr. DeBakey really points out the need to restore flow in a timely uh, manner to prevent uh, people from subsequently uh, succumbing uh, to cardiogenic uh, shock. If you look at uh, current uh, algorithms today that are utilized for uh, acute myocardial infarction and uh, cardiogenic uh, shock, uh, you know, we really kind of address the 50% of the people that are going to survive from the uh, PCI, the infarct-related artery, and we've kind of left barren this whole other half of the equation, the, you know, roughly 50% of the people that are dying, and, and what should we be doing with them? And even in the age of PCI, the infarct-related artery, uh, these mortalities, uh, depending on the level of shock uh, that is looked at, continue to range right around 50%. And, you know, this is uh, in the day and age where we have had major advances uh, in mechanical circulatory support, where on the one hand, in chronic heart failure, we have at our disposal uh, devices that are very readily uh, implanted through minimally invasive uh, incisions and can last for uh, decades and whose uh, adverse event profiles have really uh, substantially improved over the years. In our program, we, we took a lot of lessons uh, from shock trauma, and we felt that there are a lot of parallels between uh, cardiogenic shock and shock trauma. The shock uh, trauma network, uh, which has been developed, has obviously had major impacts on survival of shock trauma, uh, some of the other lessons was this need uh, to get people out of shock within a timely manner. In shock trauma, they talk about getting people out of shock within one hour, uh, the so-called golden hour. And if you don't get them out of shock within that hour, then you subsequently suffer from multi-system organ failure and the systemic inflammatory response. And despite ameliorating the underlying problem, they go on to die. And this is a fairly young population uh, compared to the population that we're dealing with. When you look back at the shock trial itself, uh, the times to revascularization, uh, and especially in the cabbage arm, were on the median about 20 hours, and even out to uh, 30 hours in, in some cases. And, and you know, this really uh, prompted some questions uh, from our group. You know, were these people remaining in continuous shock uh, for 30 hours? In these people, 
the roughly 50 percent of people that died, I mean, at what point did they die? And at what point did these people uh, cross the event horizon to the point of no return to where, despite the restoration of flow, they would continue to die from multi-system organ failure? And if we could predict these people on presentation, would that change what we did? in the people that were going to uh, improve with revascularization versus those who would not? Uh, would we address these people differently? We ultimately felt that really uh, time was of the essence, that we could restore flow. Like with door-to-balloon time, where time is muscle, with MCS, there were certainly time points that could be crossed to where if you ultimately implanted systems with restored flow, it would nonetheless be futile. And we sought to address this. We have previously designed algorithms uh, to get people onto durable implantable continuous flow LVADs prior to the establishment of irreversible cascade of multi-system organ failure and the systemic inflammatory response. This was a obviously single uh, institutional, uh, non-randomized, case uh, series of a fairly large number of patients. And at the end of the day, we showed roughly an 88% survival in the group that got primary uh, continuous flow LVADs who had been defined as refractory cardiogenic shot. Through this algorithm, uh, the most important thing is the time. Now, it was originally arbitrary, but nonetheless, it was a time point to where we felt that the people had not crossed the event horizon, that we could restore flow and we could salvage these individuals. Also incumbent in adopting this protocol, we recognize that, number one, myocardial unloading is a good thing. And if anything, we were not taking off the possibility of uh, recovery. If anything, we were promoting it. Number two, that these devices had changed over time that the lower adverse event profiles associated with them justified their use, as well as the durability of these devices had increased substantially. In our mind, at some points we had uh, somewhat lost uh, sight of the forest because of the trees, and potentially we were aiming at the wrong uh, target. For us, it was more about salvaging the patient uh, and not necessarily just focusing on salvaging the heart. But nonetheless, in salvaging the patient, uh, we were more apt to be able to set up the conditions where hearts that could be salvaged would be placed uh, within the uh, right milieu for this, and we certainly were not taking that off the table. So it really wasn't about the heart versus the patient. It was about both. And we certainly felt that unloading is a good thing and that it has been shown uh, consistently to promote myocardial uh, recovery. Uh, And that really this all came down to uh, was the timing of when you place these systems. This is our uh, current uh, algorithm uh, that we utilize uh, today. And as you'll notice, uh, there is... uh, method to be able to uh, get to direct uh, continuous uh, flow uh, LVAD. Uh, Some of the uh, particulars uh, of our algorithm that I would like to discuss are that uh, we do utilize uh, hemodynamic uh, parameters uh, as well as a system uh, perfusion uh, throughout the algorithm uh, to drive the uh, progression through the uh, decision tree. Uh, The definition of refractory cardiogenic shock, this is a a continued uh, shock state, Uh, and it is not, and it is clearly distinct from compensated device-dependent or drug-dependent states. Uh, The acute MCS team, uh, which is notified upon any uh, admission to the hospital of an acute uh, cardiogenic uh, shock patient, has to have decision-making uh, capabilities and evaluation of patients uh, for the right treatment are begun immediately uh, upon entry uh, into the hospital, and they're integral to the success of these programs. 
uh, in patients that have uh, received uh, CPR, uh, we, we feel it is uh, more important the uh, quality of the CPR versus the uh, duration of the CPR. And typically, we would send an arterial blood gas uh, during the CPR. In individuals that had a pH of less than 6.9, uh, we did not proceed with further support as we never had any survivors uh, in that group. Uh, taking into account that there was no respiratory uh, contribution, certainly uh, within your program, it is incumbent upon you uh, to look at and define prior to the events, prior to Mrs. Uh, Jones coming into the emergency department, have in place clearly defined protocols uh, concerning candidacy for uh, temporary systems and candidacy uh, for long-term systems. Uh, you're also going to want to uh, address uh, inter-hospital uh, transport and uh, partnerships with your uh, spoke uh, hospitals, uh, or if you are spoke, uh, defining exactly uh, you know what patients uh, should be transported, uh, who is stable enough, and who is appropriate enough uh, to be transported, as that is not a small undertaking. You're going to want to develop uh, weaning uh, algorithms for your uh, different uh, temporary systems uh, so that uh, you are doing this in a systematic uh, manner. Uh, we have also, uh, within our algorithms, utilized cardiac uh, power. Uh, we feel it is one of the more uh, predictive uh, methods of being able uh, to look at these individuals. So what do we need going uh, forward uh, in uh, temporary mechanical support? Uh, we need uh, certainly systems that are more bowel compatible, uh, systems that can be minimally invasively uh, deployed uh, and minimally invasively uh, decommissioned, uh, systems that more favorably impact the potential for myocardial recovery. Systems that potentially offer more durable support. Uh, in an Abiumed uh, series that was published uh, through use of the uh, AB5000, uh, it was noted that the vast majority of people really don't recover uh, cardiac function with even direct unloading until you get out beyond two and three uh, weeks. And I think in your mind you have to ask, well, with some of the more durable continuous flow LVADs in the chronic heart failure population, some of these systems are becoming, uh, you know, very easy to implant. And potentially we've already maybe in some individuals gotten to a point where we should be deploying these systems as primary therapy. One of the uh, other areas that I would like to uh, briefly uh, touch on is the new uh, heart allocation system uh, that is going to be coming uh, to bear in the United States fairly uh, soon. Uh, this is uh, basically a change in uh, system urgency uh, listing criteria. And what you're seeing is a uh, higher listing uh, for patients that have uh, acute shock states, and especially those requiring uh, temporary support uh, and uh, VA ECMO. And it is certainly unclear right now what the ramifications of this will be. As you can see in the slide, there are fairly uh, strict uh, time limits on this. I do believe there is some concern that individuals may be compelled to remove someone's native heart prior to adequate assessment for the potential of recovery in the fact that they may lose a window to transplant someone on temporary support at the higher urgency uh, status. The other area of concern is that individuals who have no potential for recovery may actually remain on these temporary systems longer than uh, in the past. And you may actually then uh, miss a window to where they could move on to a more durable system uh, safely. Current strategies for the majority of patients on temporary mechanical support uh, today are to utilize these systems to restore perfusion, uh, reverse any end organ dysfunction, and to adequately uh, support the patients to either early uh, recovery or to uh, transition to a more uh, durable system. The majority of patients supported on temporary systems that are candidates for durable systems can be safely uh, 
transition to implantable continuous flow vads and do not require total heart replacement. By primarily and more broadly funneling hearts to all patients with cardiogenic shock on temporary mechanical support systems, we may inadvertently explant native hearts that ultimately had the chance to recover, and we may run the risk of delaying implant of durable continuous flow LVADs, uh, missing a window of survival in those individuals. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak to you, and it has been my pleasure.